President's remarks at a ceremony awarding Milton Olive the Congressional Medal of Honor. From the Rose Garden of the White House, 21 April 1966. Mr. and Ms. Olive, the members of the Olive family, distinguished Mayor Daly, Secretary Resor, General Wheeler, members of the Senate, members of the House, ladies and gentlemen, there are occasions on which we take great pride, but little pleasure. This is one such occasion. Words can never enlarge upon acts of heroism and duty, but this nation will never forget Milton Lee Olive III. President Harry Truman once said, that he would far rather have won the Medal of Honor than to have been the President of the United States. I know what he meant. Those who have earned this decoration are very few in number. But true courage is very rare. This honor we reserve for the most courageous of all of our sons. The Medal of Honor is awarded for acts of heroism above and beyond the call of duty. It is bestowed for courage demonstrated not in blindly overlooking danger, but in meeting it with eyes clearly open. And that is what Private Olive did. When the enemy's grenade landed on that jungle trail, it was not merely duty which drove this young man to throw himself upon it, sacrificing his own life that his comrades might continue to live. He was compelled by something that's more than duty, by something greater than a blind reaction to forces that are beyond his control. He was compelled instead by an instinct of loyalty which the brave always carry into conflict. And in that incredibly brief moment of decision in which he decided to die, he put others first and himself last. I have always believed that that to be the hardest but the highest decision that any man is ever called upon to make. So in dying, Private Milton Olive taught those of us who remain how we ought to live. I have never understood how men can ever glorify war. The rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air has always been for me better poetry than philosophy. When war is foisted upon us as a cruel recourse by men who choose force to advance policy and must therefore be resisted, only the irrational or the callous and only those untouched by the suffering that accompanies war can reveal. So let us never exhort over war. Let us not for one moment disguise in the grandest justifications of policy the inescapable fact that war feeds on the lives of young men. Good young men like Milton Olive and I can never forget it. 
I am reminded of it every moment of every day. And in a moment such as this, I am reminded all over again how brave the young are and how great is our debt to them and how endless is the sacrifice that we call upon them to make for us. And I realize, too, how highly we prize freedom when we send our young to die for it. There are times when Vietnam must seem to many a thousand contradictions, and the pursuit of freedom there an almost unrealizable dream. But there are also times, and for me, this is one of them, when the mist of confusion lifts and the basic principles emerge. That South Vietnam, however young and frail, has the right to develop as a nation, free from the in interference of any other power, no matter how mighty or strong. That the normal processes of political action, if given time and patience and freedom to work, will someday, some way, create in South Vietnam a society that is responsible to the people and consistent with their traditions. That aggression by invading armies or ruthless insurgency must be denied the precedent of success in Vietnam. If the many other little nations in the world, and if, as a matter of fact, all Southeast Asia is to ever know genuine order and unexploited change, that the United States of America is in South Vietnam to resist that aggression and to permit that peaceful change to work its way because we desire only to be a good and honorable ally, a dependable, trustworthy friend, and always a sincere and genuine servant of peace. Men like Milton Olive die for honor. Nations that are without honor die too, but without purpose and without cause. And it must never be said that when the freedom and the independence of a new and a struggling people were at stake, that this mighty, powerful nation of which we are so proud to be citizens would ever turn aside because we had the harassments that always go with conflict, and because some thought the outcome was uncertain, or the course too steep, or the cost too high. In all of this there is irony, as there is when any young man dies. Who can say? What words Pride Oliver might have chosen to explain what he did? Jimmy Stanford and John Foster, two of the men whose lives he saved that day on that lonely trail in that hostile jungle 10,000 miles from here, are standing on the White House steps today because this man chose to die. I doubt that even they know what was on his mind as he jumped and fell across that grenade. But I think I do know this. On the sacrifices of men who died for their country and their comrades, 
our freedom has been built. Whatever it is that we call civilization rests upon the merciless and seemingly irrational fact of history that some have died for others to live. And every one of us who enjoys freedom at this moment should be a witness to that fact. So Milton Olive died in the service of a country that he loved. And he died that the men who fought at his side might continue to live. For that sacrifice, his nation honors him today with its highest possible award. He is the eighth Negro American to receive this nation's highest award. Fortunately, it will be more difficult for future presidents to say how many Negroes have received the Medal of Honor. For unlike the other seven, Private Oliver's military records have never carried the color of his skin or his racial origin. Only the testimony that he was a good and loyal citizen of the United States of America. So I can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to read from a letter that was written to me by this patriot's father, dated March the 10th, and I quote, it is our dream and prayer that someday the Asiatics and the Europeans and the Israelites and the Africans and the Australians and the Latins and the Americans can all live in one world. It is our hope that in our own country the Klansmen and the Negroes, the Hebrews and the Catholics, will sit down together in the common purpose of goodwill and dedication that the moral and creative intelligence of our united people will pick up the chalice of wisdom and place it upon the mountaintop of human integrity. That all mankind from all the earth shall resolve to study war no more. That, Mr. President, is how I feel. And that is my eternal hope for our great American society. And ladies and gentlemen, I have no words to add to that. <laughs>